Amen. Amen. Don't let the enemy of your soul tell you that uh, what you're going through and what you're experiencing and the pain that you're suffering now is the final story. Amen. It's not. I'm not going to land here, but I want to draw your attention to a couple of verses of Scripture. We'll put it on the screen out of 2 Timothy. Uh, Paul is writing uh, what at least we have as his last letter before he died. He may have written others, but we don't, we don't have those. And this is toward the end of that letter. He's writing to his ministerial son, Timothy. And he knows that his time on earth is, is coming to a close. And he's now concerned about how he finishes. He says, as for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I've fought the good fight. I finished the race and I've remained faithful. Now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. Mm -hmm. Now, whether we think that our life is just about through, I hope I've got a few years in me yet, uh, and I hope all of you do too. But he was focusing on a confidence that he had. That in spite of all of the stuff he went through, and he went through more than you or I have. In spite of that, he was confident that, you know what? I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And I've remained faithful. What a beautiful thing it would be is right before we get to go to glory or we end this life here, that we would be able with confidence to say those things. Amen. Well, we are looking at the end of a year. And I want to keep that attitude and take you to another passage of Scripture. And this one I welcome you to, uh, to go to in your Bibles. It's in Second John, right toward the back of the book. Uh, you can leave that other slide up first. I'm going to tell them a little bit about 2 John for a while before we get into the passage. But uh, First and Second Peter, John 1, 2, 3, Jude, Revelation. That's the end of the New Testament. So that gives you an idea if you're not sure where to find it. Uh, one of the epistles of John, uh, he's not mentioned by name, although in the translation I'm reading from, it will say John, but it's not in the, uh, in the Greek. But understanding and tradition played a role in this. People always knew that this came from John. He calls himself the elder, which is apparently something that he was uh, known by. When you think about it, John the apostle uh, was the only disciple to live a natural, live his whole natural life through. So this letter was probably written about 90, 95 AD. So along with his other two letters, the Gospel of John and the book of Revelation. These are the books that John the Apostle has authored. So he's much like, I would imagine, Paul, as we read in Paul in, Flip, or in 2 Timothy, that he's probably starting to think, you know, I'm getting old. Uh, I've been around a while. He certainly knows that by this time that he's the only remaining apostle left. And he wants to make sure of some things before he leaves this life. Don't you speak into your kids and your grandkids? Aren't there some things that you want to live beyond you? Yeah. If you're holding off, I would make it a point to do it today. If there are things you want those behind you to know, because we just never know how long this life on earth is. There are things sometimes I wish I could ask my mom or dad. My sister and I get talking about things and we say, hey, I wonder when this was, oh, let's ask, oh, wait, there's nobody to ask. Yeah. So part of finishing well is making sure that your kids and your grandkids and people within your sphere of influence understand what Jesus has done for you. We don't have to brag about what we've done. Our life should show that. But we certainly need to tell other people about what Jesus has done. Amen. So the handful of verses I want to pull out of Second John, uh, are verses 5 through 9. Uh, John writes this letter uh, to a woman. 
I believe personally that it's a figurative way that he is using that term. Uh, the Greek word is korea. It's only used twice in the New Testament, but it does appear in the Septuagint a few times. And it's just a, a way of referring to a woman. But he says, dear woman, that's how he opens his letter. I personally believe that he's speaking to the church. Uh, when he goes on to talk about some of your children are, are following, and that's a good thing. And by the way, he closes this letter when he says, greetings from the children of your sister chosen by God. I believe he's referring to the church. Uh, there would be collections of the church all over by this time. Toward the end of the first century, the church has really grown. So there would be gatherings of believers in Jesus Christ all over the known world. But I want us to pay attention to a handful of verses, and I, I won't keep you real long here. We've, we've heard a lot of good stuff. Thank you, Brother Dan. Uh, we've had some wonderful time in his presence this morning. I believe maybe God has made some things clear to some of you here. Amen. So we don't want to overload you, right? The mind can only absorb what the seat can endure. So. Starting at verse 5, I'm writing to remind you, dear friends, some translations will say, dear lady, that we should love one another. This is not a new commandment, but one we've had from the beginning. Love means doing what God has commanded us, and He has commanded us to love one another, just as you heard from the beginning. I say this because many deceivers have gone out into the world. They deny that Jesus Christ came in a real body. Such a person is a deceiver and an antichrist. I want you to pay special attention to verse 8. Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked so hard to achieve. Be diligent so that you receive your full reward. And then verse 9, anyone who wanders away from this teaching has no relationship with God. But anyone who remains in the teaching of Christ has a relationship with both the Father and the Son. There's a lot that we read in the epistles toward the end of the New Testament that let us know that in very short order, uh, probably sometime between the death of the Apostle Paul and the time this was written, there were a lot of heresies that were already coming up in the church. You know, we, we sometimes look at where the church has gone or come from or however you want to say it in our own lifetime because it's our experience. And I know people take, you know, passages of scripture out of some of the later letters and they say, this means today. And I would say, yeah, it does, but it also means 200 years ago. Right. Uh, this started a long time ago. And one of the heresies that was just getting a foothold within the church about 90 AD was a, the, the Gnostics. And the Gnostics, it, it, it's a Greek word for knowledge. And it's, it's a, a movement that claims superior knowledge. Um, they actually believed that if God was holy, he would never have created anything physical. They believed that anything physical was evil. So what happened is, it would affect the way they would live their lives. Because if everything phys physical is evil, well then I don't have to worry about the physical. So before long, uh, it, it, it grew into a thing where I just have to believe, it doesn't matter how I live. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. There's some of that today, it may not be, I mean there's Gnosticism today, but there are people who may not claim to be Gnostics, but they think all I've got to believe I just believe that God exists. I believe that Jesus exists. Well, of course you do. The Bible says, the fool says in his heart there's no God. If you're not a fool, you certainly believe in God. People who aren't following Jesus can believe in God. The demons believe and have the good sense to tremble. So, it was a very damaging heresy. They don't believe that Jesus the Son was actually in a mortal body. This was the heresy of the day when John was writing this letter. And he is encouraging the church, listen, hold fast to what you already know. He tells them to love one another. Uh, John uses that word love as far as loving one another. 
and also the love of God uh, more than any other gospel writer. His, his focus is on the love of God. And he says, don't forget to love one another. Don't forget to keep going in the way that you've already set out for. And I think when we look at this Sunday being the last Sunday and the last day of 2023, that we have to make a determination in our heart to finish well. We finish well, thank God, there's always hope as long as we're sucking in oxygen and exhaling carbon dioxide. There's always hope. If you blew it today, there's hope. This is the grace of God. Huh? No matter how far you've gone, you've not gone too far. You know that? Does somebody need to hear that today? No matter how far you've gone, you've not gone too far. If you, if you stop today and, and, and take an inventory and say, you know what, I may not have started too well, I may have had some hiccups in the middle, but I'm going to finish well. But I'll tell you what, the best way to finish well is to live well. And this is exactly what John is saying here in verse 8. Watch out that you do not lose what we, some translations say you, have worked so hard to achieve. Be diligent so that you receive your full reward. We're not talking about earning our salvation. Uh, we're not talking about earthly rewards. He's talking about this. The declaration that you made to follow Jesus, stay with it. Live well. Don't wait till the last minute. There are some people who I'm convinced at the very last moment received Christ as Savior. And there's arguments, there have been arguments for years. Do you believe in deathbed conversion? Well, I don't believe. Yes, some people say I do believe. Certainly if the heart is genuine, absolutely. Yeah. The grace extends, right? Yes. I've prayed with people in hospitals that were, if you've been by someone who's dying, you know what the, the death rattle is, and you know what the final time. I've prayed with people in that state and urged them to follow Jesus. So God has the final say on those situations, we don't know. But why in the world would you want to live like hell and try to get away with anything you can and then expect that at the last minute you're just going to make it all right? Amen. Thank God for a gracious, loving, heavenly Father that takes us right as we are. Amen. And, and thank God that it doesn't matter where you came from or what you've been doing. But man, if you really want to finish well, you've got to live well. The caution in this passage of Scripture is against those who are teaching something to deceive. Uh, this translation, the New Living, says such a person is a, de a deceiver and an antichrist. But we think of antichrist, the, the, the prefix anti, to be against. And that's okay. But I think it's best to understand it as another. Another Christ. And if you notice in your Bibles, it's small a, I think, in all translations. Small a, antichrist. There are many antichrists already in the world. That means there are many alternate pathways to God, as if there were any, right? There are self-proclaimed antichrists, another way. And obviously, one who is claiming to be another way is also against Christ. So both interpretations are fine. But when we think of those who are against Christ, they have another Christ. Well, you know, Paul wrote in a couple places about people who would claim to, to be preaching another Jesus. I'd like you real quick to run to 2 Corinthians 11.4. The church in Corinth was a, a quite, a, quite a pain <laughs> in Paul's side. Um, I think certainly he, he hoped that he could convince them that they had to let go of, of some of the stuff from their old lives and let the Holy Spirit sanctify them. This was a church that was used in, in the gifts of the Spirit, no doubt.
but they were not spiritually mature, which is why being filled with the Spirit is different than being sanctified by the Spirit. But we won't get into that. But at any rate, 2 Corinthians 11.4. You happily put up with whatever anyone else tells you, even if they preach a different Jesus than the one we preach, or a different kind of spirit than the one you received, or a different type of gospel than the one you believe. And he, he goes further and he basically says to them, can, can I just actually say some things about myself that I'm even too embarrassed to say? You know, and he defends his apostleship with them. And you can hear the cry that he doesn't want to brag on himself, but he's trying to get it through their thick heads, what it means to follow Jesus. I don't know if any of you have ever had connection with people like that that you just wish, how can I get you to understand what it means to follow Jesus? And he's telling them, listen, don't listen to these other people that are making up another Jesus or another gospel. We also hear from the pen of Apostle Paul in Galatians 1.8. Let's take a look at that real quick. Let's keep on moving back through. You'll find it. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. So Galatians 1.8 Let God's curse fall on anyone, including us or even an angel from heaven, who preaches a different kind of good news than the one we preach to you. And verse 9, let's continue with that. I say again, what we have said before, if anyone preaches any other good news than the one you welcome, let that person be cursed. We don't think about God cursing. I mean, that seems like a strange thing to us, uh, that the devil curses, but there are things that God cannot stand and God cannot abide. Yes. Amen. There's going to be a day when grace ends. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know when that's going to be. But there will be a time. There will be an accounting. You're either living for Jesus or you're not. Amen. And I think sometimes too many people just say, well, tomorrow. Tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. And then tomorrow never comes mm -hmm. until it comes like that. Yep. And it's not just a matter of missing heaven and spending eternity in hell. It's not just that. But that is a possibility even for the believer. I mean, I don't think anyone is going to rip your salvation from you, but you can forfeit it. That's true. You can turn away. I think that's a long process. It doesn't happen overnight. But what I want to stress to you today is not as much that, but what you forfeit in this life. The, the, the relationship that you surrender because you've decided you're just not going to live well. And people come along, today we don't have a lot of people talking about Jesus not coming uh, in a physical body, but we do have people preaching another Jesus. We have people saying, oh, how could a God, how could a God of love send people to hell? And you, perfect. He doesn't. They send themselves. How could a loving God allow so much pain and sickness and hunger around the world? Well, how could people still be dirty with the plentiful abundance of soap? Yeah. <laughs> oh, Jesus doesn't care about, you know, some of these things. That's just old-fashioned. You need to change with the times. I'm going to shack up with whoever I want to shack up with. And I'm going to love anybody I want to love. And if it feels good for me, I'm going to do it. I can identify as anything I want. You understand where that comes from? It comes from the pit of hell. And it's all designed by the enemy to drag people down into a life of bondage and regret. The church has probably, no, the church has done a disservice to people who are 
bound in that kind of bondage by dismissing them. But there's also a segment of what would be called the church, at least by most people, that will say, you go ahead, be whatever you want to be. And what it does, it's another Jesus. And it slaps Jesus right in the face. That the eternal Son of God came to earth, lived a sinless life, but endured all the punishment that Brother Dan talked about, and death on a cross, just so people could choose him or somebody else. Seriously. It's time to get serious, friends. we we got to live well so that we finish well. And, and I know you've heard me say this before, but it is so heavy and strong on me. Next year is going to demand more. And, and I'm not so stupid as to think that it won't be too much for some of you. It might, it might be too much. God is requiring us to step up to the plate and, and listen. Following another Jesus isn't going to cut it. Got to live well if we're going to finish well. And I guess I'm at that point in my life too that I'm healthy and I thank God for it. But I'm smart enough to know that I've got a whole lot more years behind me than I have in front of me. And even in ministry, I, I have no plans to retire anytime soon. But there'll be a time, right? And it's, it's gonna, I'm going to have fewer years to work than I have in the past. Yeah. And so to me, it's important to put things in place, which is why we've tried to do some stacking, some things. It, it should never happen that a pastor retires and the church has to spend two years catching up. God, God has such plans. I, I walk out here in this parking lot and I look back at the church, and I don't think I've ever shared this publicly before. <clears throat> There's a lot of things I just can't share. But God's constantly daring me to, to dream bigger. And I look back at this building and I see Revival Center. Yeah. I don't know what that means. And I try not to put, you know, all the what ifs on that. Because every time I've followed God in a dream, it has never worked out the way I thought it would. Yeah. Never, never. But man, there's just so many things falling into place. But it's de demanding more. Demanding more. And if we're not living well, we're not going to finish well. If you're listening to another Jesus, or you're putting your faith in something beside the shed blood of Jesus on Calvary, you're not going to finish well. If you have changed scripture around to take the words of Jesus, only the, the nice, fluffy words of Jesus, and you ignore the harsh words of Jesus, it's not, you're not going to finish well. Right. And I have a hard enough time sometimes when, when I get this overwhelming sense of the something that's coming. Can I handle it? You know? What do I need to let go of? What do I need to embrace? Um, so I don't want you to think that I've got this all figured out. But there's a knowing that every part of our lives, every part of our commitment to Jesus, it has to be all that. It has to be all that. If we are going to finish well, we have to live well. Can you put that last part of that scripture, the one that has verse 8 in it, again, uh, just so I don't misquote it? Watch out that you do not lose what we've worked so hard or what you've worked so hard to achieve. Be diligent so that you receive your full reward. Don't go backwards. Don't go back. You can't go back. You can't change the past. Stop talking about it. Huh? Stop talking about it. Stop living there. 
Stop saying what if. Stop saying if only. Go forward.